Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, MNT Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates, Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Eastern Consolidated, Goldman Properties, The Moynian Group, Muss Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Triangle Equities. So there's negotiation. There's an art of negotiation. But who is a negotiator? Do you negotiate everything? Do you negotiate contracts? Do you negotiate dealing with uh, the communists, dealing with the Chinese, dealing with everyone, with the Arabs? Yeah, there's a negotiator. I have today the world's most famous negotiator, the man who's negotiated everything from his own children to cars to airplanes to other things. I have the legendary negotiator, the Brooklyn-born Herb Cohn. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, Herb, let, let's, let's start, you know, let's go back to, to your father. You know, I always like go back to the history. You, your dad came from Poland, you said. Yes. And so you told me he came through, like, three different countries. Tell me a little bit. He about. walked. He uh, looked around Rapine, Poland at the time, realized there was limited opportunity, and he decided to come to America. And so he walked across Poland, uh, Germany. Um, he got to Antwerp, worked on the docks there, uh, got enough money to uh, come to the United States. Now, he came alone? Alone. There was no family or anything? No. No, he had like a third cousin somewhere. Did he first move to Brooklyn, or did he move to the Lower East Side? He moved to the Lower East Side, and uh, he roomed with uh, several people who worked at different times, so they split the, the beds usage. And uh, he saved up money, brought his brother over, and they then started bringing family members over. In the midst of all of this, he was drafted into the Army. The First World War. First World War. He and his brother, his brother served overseas and brought home a French war bride. And, uh, so that's how he met your mother. She was a French war bride? No, no, no. This is my uncle. My mother came over from Poland. So how did your mother meet your father? Uh, they were social groups at the time. Uh, you know, like the societies? Yes, yeah, society. Right. The, the societies were, you know, they had a variety of purposes. They, they met to introduce, and then they also met to have a society grave later on at New Montefiore. That's correct. They had what they called Lanslein. Lanslein. Yeah, and uh, that's how they met, and they were really uh, very different. My mother was a woman who... Uh, 
believed if you uh, lie still, they throw dirt on you. So she wanted her children to be active. My father uh, was a person whose negotiating style was giving more than he got. Uh, he was very uh, unique uh, person. He believed that being was more important than appearing. Uh, that a man with a big canoe had big problems. So he so he wanted to show modesty. He was a modest guy. He didn't believe in material possessions. How did he get into the, the hat band business, your father? Well, he worked uh, three, four jobs. My uncle was over here, and the two of them went into business. And uh, he continued to work in other jobs to support this fledging business, and then they suddenly were able to sustain that business. It was a small business, bias binding. It was uh, at uh, Broadway at 8th Street. Today, the building, of course, is gone, but it was near NYU and, and Washington Square uh, Park. Uh, and uh, my father believed in very hard work. He, when I was growing up as a kid, um, he used to work seven days a week, then six days a week. And as I mentioned to you, my father was like pro-union because when the union came, he could take two weeks right. off. It was, it was a benefit. Uh, the, the, the real reality was this was a way for him not to work seven days a week. Yeah. This was a way for him to take two weeks off in the summer because yes. he had to give the employees two weeks off in the summer. Yeah. Now, how did your parents end up in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn? Uh, I guess, you know, they moved. I think they were the first one uh, of their family that moved, and they were in Bensonhurst, and the subway line was pretty good. Right, it's pretty good for traffic. To yeah, in those days, you could, you know, everyone went by subway. You take the West End, you know, you can go to 14th Street, and you take the local back to 8th Street. You know, I made that trip, you know. So, of, now, you're, you're the second child. Your sister was born first. Yes. She's four years older than you. And, and as you said, your sister was really smart. She was like eight years ahead of you in school. Yes. How'd that happen? I mean, <laughs> I know there was SP. I know there were other things, but eight years. I mean. Well, as I say defensively, in those days, they used to skip people. And so she skipped, and uh, suddenly she's at Brooklyn College. She's majoring in calculus and minoring in physics, and she's brilliant. And uh, she graduates college, she's 18. And so one of the things I was taught to do was to think about the world. And it's, my sister was like very bright. Therefore, when people would say to me, girls are not good in math, I would laugh at them. These were morons too, who told me this. Girls were not good at school. What are you kidding? I, I think, you know, since I'm a Brooklyn boy, I went to Lincoln, you went to Lafayette. Yes. But, you know, you were living on 21st Avenue mm -hmm. and 85th. 85th Street, right off 86th Street, which was the busy traffic, you know, the retail and everything over there. And when you were going to public school, you know, it, it's very interesting. A lot of the people that you grow up with, um, initially you went to public school, and I saw this picture. I don't know how I found it. With you wearing these jackets with a W? Yes. What, what was the W? What did they W stand? was the... I mean, you didn't go to Wingate. I mean, it was... No, no. Uh, yeah. That was our own club, the Warriors. We were a basketball team that played... We played at St. Finbar's, the 18th Street, uh, 18th Avenue, YMCA, and the JCH, the Jewish Community House on... Uh, Bay Parkway and 78th Street. And for years, we played basketball there. You know, let's talk about, I mean, you, one of your friends growing up, and we're t a friend today, is Larry King, who was Larry Ziegler at that time? Yes, Larry Ziegler. Okay, but when you and Larry, I think one of the most interesting stories was you had Mopo. Ma friend, Mopo. Mopo, okay, that you, Larry... And there was another friend who... Brazi Abadi. Brazi. That all of a sudden, Mapo, who had asthma, 
you decided to say that Mapo was deceased and you were raising money. T tell me that story. Well, we were walking the school. Brazi Abadi, who today is now a medical doctor. And he's the surgeon. He's a surgeon and he, he works in China. He's part owner of a hospital with the Chinese government and he's also in North Carolina. Uh, Brazi, myself, and Larry were walking to school and this kid came up to us and says, hey, what's, you know, in Brooklyn in those days, if you spoke low, everyone leaned in, and if you spoke through the side of your mouth, that gave you greater credibility. He said, hey, guys, what's the story on Mapo? We said, what do you mean? He hasn't been in school. Is he all right? We said, we don't know. The guy comes back a little while. Now, you're in junior high school at this time. Junior high school. Bensonhurst Junior High School. And uh, this guy comes back, asks us again. I have a rule. You ask me twice, I tell you the truth. Third time, I make something up to get you off my back. So the third time, he asked me, where's Mapo? I said, look, I'm going to tell you, but keep it a secret, okay? This is off the record. Mapo is dead. And this was startling news. And uh, the guy took off, and when we got to school, the place was buzzing with news of the demise of Mapo. You know, kid 13 years old had died. And uh, the principal or someone got the idea that maybe we should do something for Mapo. Uh, the principal had his uh, secretary call Mapo's home. The phone was disconnected, which reinforced the idea that he was deceased. And we then collected money not just in our homeroom class, other homerooms wanted to and, and the money was going to go to a Mapo Monument? Mapo oh, well, Memorial. Ma Memorial Fund? Ma Mapo Memorial Fund used to help people, okay? For humanity. This was going to be a blessing. Also to be utilized by the three of you to eat. At the beginning, we didn't realize this. However, we collected so much. You know, we collected... $60. We had thought 30 would be sufficient. So what would we do with the extra? We would go to Nathan's in Coney Island. Right. It was on the train. You, you were right nearby. You took, you take uh, to the water. That's Went down to Nathan's, had gourmet food. Okay. We had hot dogs, some sauerkraut, mustard. Uh, Especially the fries. Fries were great. Fries were great. And then we came back and the principal was still so impressed. And, and at that time, uh, the New York Times was under a lot of pressure uh, because people were complaining they didn't do any stories of events going on outside of Manhattan. And their attitude was, nothing happens outside of Manhattan. Well, here we have this event in Brooklyn where these altruistic young men at this age were giving their all for a deceased comrade. And so we had this special assembly in honor of Mapo. The New York Times reporter came. He was sitting right in the front row. We knew who he was. He had a pad. He was one of the few people that were literate in our old school. And uh, we were sitting there, and there were speeches on behalf of Mapo. And we didn't know this at the time. Uh, but that morning, Mapo, who was in Arizona because, because he had asthma. asthma, his father sent him there for like three weeks, was returning to school. Now, the school started at 8.15, but the assembly, in order not to take away from the regular school, started at 7.45. And uh, Mapo arrived at 8.15 to go to school. He went up to the homeroom. And the secretary, not the teacher who was down in the assembly, said, they're all downstairs, you know, not recognizing who Mapo was. And Mapo tried to get in, but the door was locked. He went outside. They had these steel doors. We're all sitting on the stage. Suddenly, we hear the doors crash, and they swing open, and there he is. Everyone in the audience turns. You know, and they start laughing. And then I realized what had happened. 
I panicked. You know, it wasn't like I was cool. No, I panicked. I got up and said, go home, Mapo, you're dead. So, wait, so I have a question. When this happened, did they try to suspend you from school? Yeah, well, the first thing was that the, super, uh, the uh, principal said, I'll meet you in my office. So we went down to the office. Larry King, the famous Larry King, is crying, okay, crying. He's having a nervous breakdown, brazzy body. Keep saying, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. I'll never get into medical school. This will be on my permanent record. And I am burdened with these two guys. I had to keep my calm. So we went into the office, and uh, the principal said, you guys are criminals, okay? I'm going to take care of you. You're not going to high school. We were supposed to go to Lafayette High School. You're not going to high school. You're going to jail. You're on a prison. Forget jail. Directly to prison. And I said, look, maybe we could talk about this, okay? So you started negotiation at 13. Yeah, I didn't realize you I didn't was trapped. You didn't realize the art of negotiation at Yeah, 13. I didn't realize I was trying to get out of this. And I said, look, uh, we're nobody. You know, when you fall from the second floor, and we're not even on the second floor, you bruise your body, but you walk away. But when you fall from the sixth floor, you leave a big indentation with the ground and your body. You're on the sixth floor. So maybe we could talk about this and work something out. All right. And so, so we So did. in reality, this is the real beginning of negotiation with you. But let's, let's go yeah. on. You graduate Lafayette. While you're in high school, you go to work with your father sometimes on the weekend yeah. and other things. But And then... Like many kids, you were saying many of them worked in the Catskills, which I think you work one summer or something. Yeah. But, but you, you know, you know, people used to say, now the New York Times that you still read, even though you're in Florida, one of the few people who read it in Delray, perhaps, <laughs> as you said, you know, people, f I found my job in the New York Times. And you found your job. But this was interesting. You find the job at this time up in Harlem. Now, yeah. you liked it because you were able to figure the subways, right? It was the same subways. What yeah. was this well, with the NAACP? What, what, is, well, what is the negotiator doing well, there? Well, what happened was originally I found the job at the Rivoli Theater. Right. Uh, as the ticket taker. I think well, that's I started as an usher. I moved up to ticket taker. And the movie was David, David and Bathsheba with Gregory Peck and Susan Hayward, which... To this day, I can quote lines from the movie I saw so many times. And I got fired, actually fired, not asked to leave. Get out of here now, because I had let friends in without them paying, and they counted the house. And so I went back to the New York Times, and uh, there was a job. And the way I thought in those days, look, it was two subways. It was like going to the Yankee Stadium. Okay, because it was in Harlem. I didn't know Harlem. And it was working for the NAACP. It was in 1952. Right before Brown versus the Board of Education. Which I didn't know Brown versus the Board of Education. I knew they were preparing. Thurgood Marshall was in the office. And the, my immediate superior was a, a gentleman who uh, was uh, the former dean of Howard law school. He had actually gone to Harvard Law School. He was African-American. And uh, we worked, you know, preparing and do I was doing essentially clerical work. But that uh, sensitized me to this whole issue. Let, let's talk about when you, when you graduated Lafayette, you, it was 1950, you were 17 years of age, and you didn't want to go to Brooklyn College because your sister went to Brooklyn College, and you enrolled in City College. Yes. And then what, what happened? Your father realized that you were going to City College, and he said, boy, chick, you can't go here anymore because I, you're taking a, a, a position away from another person. What yeah, happened over Well, my there? father said, look, he, was, he found out that my sister was going to Brooklyn College too late to do anything. You know, he found her after two years, and she wouldn't leave. And my mother sided with her. But then I enrolled at City College because I didn't want to go to the same place that everyone went to. I was reliving my sister's life 
Yeah, plus the trains weren't really good to, to Brooklyn College. You had to take buses, right? Yeah. yeah. You had to take a bus right. at least to the, the train. Yeah, and on City College, at least you could take two, a newspaper. Two you could read the, the Mirror and the Post, you know. City College was the same ride as Yankee Stadium. Uh, that's how I looked at the world. That was my paradigm. It was the Yankee Stadium. New York in those days had like eight or nine newspapers. So you have newspapers going and coming. And this was an education. I enjoyed the papers very much. So what happens? He, he realizes that you go to City College? I start City College. All right. My father finds out about this. He, and he's really upset. No, no. You did this to me with uh, uh, Rini, my sister, who, by the way, his name is Rini, not Renee. My parents didn't know the accent aigu. Okay, so Rini. You did this with Rini. You're not doing it with him. Uh, you're taking the space away from a child who can't afford to go to college. It's not fair. And in those days, you know, NYU wasn't that expensive. Uh, so you went to NYU, not the Heights. You went to NYU downtown. Downtown. Okay. Now, while you're at NYU, the Korean War is going on, and you get drafted. Yes. And where do you go during the Korean War? Well, I, uh, first of all, this has caused me to become, for a slight period of time, an agnostic because the rabbi told us at Fort Dix, don't worry, you'll be here, tell your parents, basic training, you'll do every, for 39 weeks, everybody does basic training. Yeah, you know, relax, the rabbi said. And uh, that morning, they rat raced us onto a plane, and we went to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas where I did my basic training and my advanced training. And then now, I... Now, what was your training in? I mean, well, I was a cannoneer, but since I had such an uncanny ability to type, I became a typist, even though I was a cannoneer. I went to clerk typist school. But uh, when I went overseas, half went to Japan, which meant Korea, and half went to Germany, you know, which, because we had a big NATO contingent there. And, and they said the first day, is there anyone here who knows French? Well, I raised my hand, you know. I have French. This is my language. You know, do I know French? I figured I'm in Paris, you know, which was where NATO was at that time before de Gaulle pulled them out. And uh, while I was doing this, everyone that I came over with got reassigned. And uh, they were all in big cities, which is great because you don't do anything. And I'm now on a train going east. The train goes to Frankfurt. I and another guy are the only two people there. He says, let me see your, your papers. I showed him. He says, they changed your MOS. You a tanker. Okay, in other words. Typist and tanker, uh, abyssal. Not, I never yeah. been in a tank, but I'm a gunner. He says, don't worry, you don't have to drive. You're the gunner in the tank. And I'm in an outfit that's patrolling the east-west border. I'm the only person, forget New York, I'm the only person from a metropolitan area. I'm rooming with guys who are from the deep south. Not even like, if I would have gotten a guy from Atlanta or Charlotte, that would have been wonderful. I got guys from northern Louisiana, from Mississippi. Uh, every night we come off the, the line and they play their records. The guy in the bunk below me is crying. One day I put my arm around, I said, what's the matter? His name was Harmon Rubel. He says, I'm only 14. He's 14 years of age. So I said, I gotta get out of here. This is dangerous, these guys are crazy. <laughs> you got killed. I'm in a place called Bad Kissingen, which by the way, military guys know how crazy this place was. In fact, these guys were shooting at the East Germans. I was out one day, they fired a bazooka at an East German guard tower, you know, and so they brought in an engineering outfit, then they brought in a head to try to get these guys educated, but it was to no avail. So I then get a job in courts and boards, which is a good deal. I can now type a little bit. And then, I start refereeing basketball games. Right, because you played basketball when you went to high school. Yes. And then 
I start coaching basketball. And I end up coaching a team that wins the European Basketball Championship. So you're in the military and you're coaching a basketball team? Yes. Okay, so it was a very, uh, an interesting job. Yes. Okay, so, so after two years, you come back to New York, uh, back to NYU. And what were you studying? You were a liberal arts student, right? You, you really didn't know what you wanted at that time. I, the first two years, I never went to school. I mean, I never went to class. You know, uh, and then I met my wife. Right, in the cafeteria. In met the cafeteria Ellen. at NYU. I met my wife, and uh, she says, I'll meet you after class in the hall. I said, well, can we meet in the cafeteria? She said, why? Well, I don't go to class, which she found incomprehensible. And she explained to me the importance of going to class, which, by the way, I found to be unbelievable. School was so much easier. Because teachers would ask on exams the stuff they covered in class. I now had notes to study. See, previously, what I did was I would make deals with the teacher. You know, I tell my yeah, sure, negotiate. Yeah, I was negotiating with teachers. I, the reason I wasn't there was I was very sick and I have a blood disease and I don't know how long I'm going to live. So if I could take the exam, and, and if I got like a, a C in the exams, they would give me a D. Or well, if I got a B, sometimes I got an A, they would give me a B. Uh, but now I had notes, I was in class, and I got like 22 straight A's. So now you graduate NYU, and why did you, you decided to go to law school? Because you couldn't get a job. It, weren't, it was another recession. No, no, no. I, I knew I wanted to go to law school, and my wife was still going to school. Right. She was going to NYU, which I got into like Columbia and other law schools, but I went to NYU because she was still at NYU. And so the two of us got married, and we weren't long-range planners. Right, people. you were you're living in Brooklyn at that time, right? Ocean Avenue? Yeah, Ocean Parkway. Parkway Ocean Parkway. And uh, we had this little dinky apartment. It was rent control and wasn't worth what we were paying. And uh, so uh, we have no money, so I decide I got to get a job. And you find the New York Times once again. New York Times once again. Job says uh, claims adjuster. You said because your father and mother would never put in a claim. He never wanted to file an insurance claim because he was afraid that they would cancel his coverage. Yes. So the person who totally against that thing now becomes a claims adjuster for the legendary Allstate Insurance Company. Yeah. In Brooklyn. It was a job. Right. It was a job, and they gave you a car. A car? Remember, I'm a subway guy. I judge things by subways. Just like in the street, the way I would measure was by sewers, by manhole covers, you know. Sure, but that was because of the stick ball. Stick ball. You punch, know, stick ball. You know, punch ball and stick ball. That's how, but same thing, distances, I would measure by the BMT. I even knew the lights. Green and yellow. Next week, because we have to continue, we will continue as you start your life with Allstate and your life in negotiation. See you next week. Okay.